Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Thank you for tuning in to The Dean Show. I'm Eddie, your host. And every week we're here with a new exciting episode, with a new exciting guest. And with all the hocus pocus mumbo jumbo that's out there, people misrepresenting Islam, so-called experts on Islam, you know where to come to learn about Islam. You come to The Dean Show where you get the facts, not fiction, from true experts. People who have memorized the verbatim word of God, the Quran, people who live Islam, People who are living this life day to day, not people who are in it for the business. Because you know there's big business in bashing Islam nowadays. So don't get into following the hype that's out there that's been created to confuse you. You want to get unconfused, you've come to the right place. The Dean Show. Well, we've done hundreds of shows. We've done so many shows on so many different topics. And if you just open your mind, you have a sincere heart, and you sit back, and you go through some of our archives. If you're not catching us live on the TV, you can go to thedeanshow.com. And we've covered so many different hot topics on a lot of these issues, on a lot of this fiction that people have put out there. And you'll get a better understanding, and you'll see that, you know what? Islam is not about killing innocent men, women, and children. Islam is not, is not about oppressing, subjugating the women. Islam is not about all this hocus pocus mumbo jumbo. And that's why people are accepting Islam, submission to establishing a relationship with the one who created you, the one God, submitting to him, doing the good that he's told you to do. The same way Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the messengers of God, they submitted, they called people to have a direct relationship, not submitting or worshiping the creation, but establishing a direct relationship with the one creator. It's a beautiful thing when you find out the purpose of life and why you've been created. And our next guest, leading on to this week's episode, our next guest, that's what he did. He found, figured out what the purpose of life. He came from a Catholic background. He was in the Navy. And he's here today to share his story on how he came to, this, to Islam. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Jay Dean when we come back here on The Dean Show. This is The Dean. This is the Dean Show. 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 Back here on the Dean Show, and we're here with Jay Dean. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And peace be back upon you. Jay Dean, Jamal Dean, was that always your name? Well, of course not. Uh, I was brought up here in uh, the United States, and I was born with the name of James. And after accepting Islam, I changed my name to something that was more beneficial. Uh, Jamal, which means beautiful, and Deen, means, which means the way of life. So it's a beautiful way of life of Islam. Now, did you have to change your name? It wasn't mandatory, but the Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him, said if your name is something that is, uh, has no meaning and is uh, undesirable, uh, then change it to something that would be pleasing to, in the sight of God. And so this was a personal choice that I took, and uh, Jamal was very close to the word James. So it was an easy transition, but it had meaning and substance to it. So as I said before, Jamal means uh, beautiful, and then Dean means the way of life. And I looked at Islam as the beautiful way of life that all human beings should follow, uh, trying to worship the Creator. Now, since you changed your name, did you also, like, since you accepted Islam, like, have to stop being American? <laughs> of course not. Uh, uh, most people confuse this and think that uh, once you become Muslim that you become this isolationist and uh, that you're separate from the American society. But uh, most people do not understand that Muslims have been here long before most people in America. And so uh, the Muslim 
values are here in America. They're part of the Constitution of the United States. And it is something that that document would not have been possible if it wasn't for Islam. And so actually it has actually enhanced my being an American by becoming a Muslim. Uh, the rules, the, uh, the different things that we had to give up, like the bad things in society like alcohol and uh, premarital sex, all of these things that are very harmful to a human being. Uh, when you go ahead and become a Muslim, you, you look at these things and you start to correct these things. And so that's what I did. I went through a process in that and it took me time. It wasn't something that happened overnight. And as I got rid of all of these things, I started to become closer to my creator. I became a good neighbor. I became a good father. I became a good son. And these things were something that God would like and God would be pleased with. And so this made me a better American, I, I would say. Tell us a little bit about your life before Islam. We heard you used to be in the U.S. Navy. Um, my life before Islam, uh, I, I like to say it was a life without guidance. Um, I, I grew up as most normal Americans. I uh, actually grew up in a small little uh, farm town with uh, a lot of cows, chickens, you know, normal farm town. Uh, very small population, very sheltered uh, environment, uh, wasn't exposed to many cultures, many different religions, many different languages, so very sheltered society. Um, I went through what most Americans go through. Uh, they go through a battle with uh, choosing their own friends when I was younger. And so I started following people that uh, were drinking alcohol, uh, the whole club scene, things like that. And so I went down that path. But I saw something in my mind that said that this is not the way to live. And so I started to question, there has to be something more to life than this. And so I decided that I needed guidance. I needed morals. I needed values. And I thought that I could find this in the United States Navy. And so after graduating high school and that, I decided to join the U.S. Navy. I traveled around a little bit and I, I did get uh, discipline. Uh, Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks be to God. Uh, but I did not find the guidance. In fact, I found more misguidance than what I found of guidance. Uh, after we would get done being soldiers during the week, we would hang up our bootstraps and then uh, all of us would head to the bar. And so we would start drinking and uh, we would start uh, chasing after women, all of the things that normal Americans do that they do not realize that is very harmful to their body and to their relationship with the Creator. And so, even on the weekends and that, I was at the bar so much, I decided to start working at a bar. And so I used to be the one that would check the IDs at the, at the door, uh, kind of like the bouncer of the club. And so that, that's kind of where I went into Islam. Um, I met a woman that used to come into the club. Um, she, uh, she was underage. She had a fake ID. I, I let her into the club. Um, she fell down the steps one night because uh, she was so drunk. And the club owner, uh, who happened to be Arab at the time, uh, also a Muslim, but I did not know this at the time, asked me to get her out of the club because he was afraid to lose his liquor license, afraid to lose his uh, club, afraid of getting arrested. And so I carried the woman up the stairs, put her into a cab with her and her friend, and I gave her my number. Uh, she came back to the club in that, and we ended up starting dating. And one day she came to me and she started crying. And she said, someone is going to, my mo mother and father are going to make me marry someone from my home country and I don't want to marry them. I said, no problem, I will go ahead and marry you. She said, no problem, there's only one condition. You have to become a Muslim. I said, is that it? No problem, I'll become a Muslim. What is a Muslim? Like I said before, I was very ignorant to the world and everything in it. So I had no clue what a Muslim was, what Islam was. I had no clue what these things were. So. She said, it's very simple. All you have to do is you have to say there is no God but God and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his last and final messenger. And then you are a Muslim. So she took me down to the, the local uh, mosque and I took my Shahada, which is the declaration of faith, and I became a Muslim. The sad thing is, is the first day that I became a Muslim was the last day that I was at the mosque. And we still continued to do the drinking and partying and going out and doing all of these things that was against the religion of Islam, this way of life. So 
this is my journey and how I came into Islam, but it didn't stop there. Uh, as I started to read more of the Quran, as I started getting understanding of my relationship with the Creator, I started to question things that we were doing that were going in contrary to what God's laws were. And so we used to get into a lot of fights about these because we were kind of at a crossing roads. Uh, she was heading out of Islam and I was heading towards Islam. And so at these crossroads and that, we decided to part ways. And I continued my studying, I continued my path on Islam and started to change some of the defects of character that I had instilled in myself from a lot of days of ignorance and following my base desires. And so when I got rid of all of these things, I was able to focus more on what was important in life, what each of us is created for, to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. And if we're going to worship something, I figured I might as well worship the creator instead of any of the creations. Now, in, upon investigating all the religions, I remember finding out the meaning of what Islam is, what a Muslim is. Those who surrender their self to God is a Muslim. Those who surrender, submit to God, God's will. That is it. Islam was pure. It was just, you just pray to God, your creator. Now you mentioned Muslim, Muslim club owner, then you mentioned this woman who's Muslim and you know all this seems opposite Islam. Please elaborate on this. Yes, uh, when I first came to Islam, I, I, I like to state this and many other people have said this before me, but it's 100% true. If I would have followed the action of some of the Muslims and the way that they were practicing their faith, I would not have chose this way of life. But as I started to research about the Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him of Islam, and his message and what he taught and how he was a perfection of the morals and characters of a human being, and I followed that example and the example that he taught to his followers. That right there makes it a complete way of life. God Almighty says in the Quran, he says, today I have perfected your religion for you. Not for the Muslims, not for, for uh, the Arabs, but for all of mankind. And so that was what I was looking for. And that was what I was trying to follow. And that's why I said, when I look back on it and I see that he was an Arab and he was owning a club uh, which goes against the religion of Islam because he's selling alcohol. He's promoting an environment where people are committing illegal sexual intercourse. These sort of things that go against the teachings of Islam. This is the irony that I, I saw. And so I started following the practices that are taught in the Quran and in the Sunnah, the way of life that the Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him, taught to his followers. And so when I did that, I saw a change in myself and I saw a change in the people that were surrounding me. And this is what, why I chose the name of Jamal Din, uh, the beautiful way of life. So why would anyone want to accept Islam with all the negative stereotypes and stigma that's attached to it? That, that's, that's the question that uh, is for the ages there. Um, basically, we are in need of God's help and He is in no need of our help. Uh, there is a famous hadith that reports that the Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him, says that even if you were the best of creation, the best of human beings, the best of the animals, the best of anything that God created, you could not add to God's kingdom. And even if you were the worst of creation, say you were Hitler or say you were someone that committed the worst atrocities in mankind throughout the history of time, you could not take away from God's kingdom. So when you put that in perspective, we realize that it is to our benefit to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is no one's benefit. Like if someone comes to this way of life, I get no, I get no reward. I, I expect a reward from the creator. I don't expect a reward from human beings. But it gives you guidance. It gives you a way of life that gives an equal balance to all things. This is known as the religion of the middle path. You can't go too far to the left and you can't go too far to the right. You must choose a middle course. 
And this middle course is the way that was intended by the prophets all the way back to Adam, to Moses, to Noah, to Jesus, to the last and final messenger, Muhammad, may peace be upon all of the noble messengers of God. And this is what they tried to teach the people. They tried to teach them a way that they could worship the Creator and become noble human beings. And so this is what I wanted to do, and this is why we, we do this so much to spread this message, the truth about how to worship God, because it is human beings that need God. God needs nothing from them. Now tell us, did you take time to investigate other religions, and why not just follow the religion of your parents? <laughs> Good point. Uh, I, was, I was raised a Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholic, uh, but my parents were non-practicing Roman Catholics, which is the case of many Christians in America. They're Christian by name, but not Christian by practice. And so uh, I, I like to call them uh, Easter, Easter Christians uh, or Christmas Christians. They would go to the church only on Easter or Christmas. But the regular services, Sunday and stuff, they didn't care too much about. Uh, they were too busy working, things like this. And so I had concepts of God. I always questioned uh, about the religion from the very beginning since I was a little kid. And I, I remember going to some of the Catholic Church and asking questions about the Creator, asking uh, certain questions that, that the nuns and the priests, they used to get upset at. And they used to say, you have to believe, you have to blindly believe, have blind faith. These sort of things, uh, what normally in Christianity, what they tell you. So I wasn't satisfied with that. Uh, for some reason, God Almighty gave me an inquisitive mind and I started to wonder and I started to reflect about my place, my, my role in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And so when I started doing this, I had more questions that, could, that weren't being answered in my faith. So I started searching outside of the faith. I started looking into different, different isms, different religions. I started looking at Buddhism, Confucianism, started looking at Marxism, different philosophies, uh, a lot of the Eastern religions. Uh, mostly because even in Christianity and Judaism, these are Eastern religions even though they've been adopted and kind of hijacked by the West and made Western religions. Uh, but the original languages that were, they were revealed in were Eastern languages. And same thing with Islam. Um, the main difference though is in Islam, I wasn't expected to believe in something I couldn't feel, I couldn't touch, I couldn't have tangible right in front of me. Not like in Judeo-Christian theology where I'm supposed to have blind faith and to believe in the unseen without having any evidence. In Islam, you are to question these things. And in fact, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he encourages this. The Quran is revealed in an inquisitive way. It makes you answer the questions. Like, for example, God Almighty will say in the Quran, He said, is it you that creates the trees? Is it you that gives it sustenance? No, of course not. So what is the thing that gives that sustenance? What is the thing that gives sustenance to all living things? It's not human beings. It's something greater than us. It is God Almighty. And so the answers were there. Every single question that I had, had, had not answered through Judeo-Christian teachings, Every single one of them, I found a clear, concrete answer in Islam. And this is what pushed me towards this. And, and to this day, I still haven't even lifted the pages. I'm still just digging into the knowledge, and I see no end to the knowledge of learning about the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, Jay Dean, Jamal Dean, why not just stay with believing in Jesus, that Jesus was God, the Son of God, that He paid the price for your sins? What about this? <laughs> The interesting fact is uh, that Islam is the only religion that requires as an article of faith in order to be a good Muslim to believe in the Prophet Jesus is one of the mightiest messengers and that he is in fact the Messiah which the Messiah means the anointed one. Uh, it actually comes uh, from the Aramaic word that means Masiha which means to rub or to anoint. And so we accept that, that he is the, uh, the Messiah. And we also accept his miraculous birth. He was born without a father to a mother who was a virgin. We accept this. This is one part of our faith. So we are, we are actually a lot better even than in Judaism where they do not believe that he is the Messiah. So this is a major part of Islamic teaching. And we believe in the message that was revealed to the prophet Jesus. May the peace and blessings be upon him. Only the message that he taught to his followers, 
not uh, the message that is in the books today because a lot of things have been mixed into the word of the mighty prophet Jesus. I tell, I tell many Christians this. I said, imagine, imagine if we had 60,000 people, witnesses, that used to eat with Jesus, that used to stay with Jesus, that used to sleep around Jesus, that used to be around him. Imagine if you had 60,000 witnesses that were writing down the words that were coming from his mouth. What kind of treasure would that be? It would be amazing. But unfortunately today, we do not have that. But we do have that with God's final messenger, Muhammad. May the peace and blessings be upon all of the messengers of God. And so these 60,000 people were standing around this prophet, getting his words, getting his message, and clarifying how to worship the creator of the heavens and earth. And so this is the beautiful thing about the religion. And so we accept Jesus as one of the mightiest messengers of God. May Allah be very pleased with his message and clear him of the atrocities and the deification that many people do of the mighty messenger Jesus today. Tell us what were some of the challenges that you face accepting Islam? Um, of course, with anything, when you want to bring about change in that, you're going to have challenges. Um, God Almighty says in the last and final message in the Quran, He says, I do not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. And so there was a lot of bad characteristics that I had inside of myself that I had to wash out. It was kind of like taking out the garbage. I had to remove these things from myself in order to purify myself in order that I could worship the Creator properly. And in fact, uh, one of the main things that uh, Muslims do before they perform the prayer is purification. So this is the act of wudu, which is ablution, where you're going to purify yourself by washing yourself and your body so you can be clean before the eyes of Almighty God. And so this purification process is an ongoing effect of a Muslim's life. And so the more that you become clean, the more that you get out all of these negative things, the better person you become, the better father you become, the better daughter, the better son, the better human being, the better neighbor that you become as a human being in society and in general. Now, on the regret part, there is not a thing that I regret about choosing this way of life. This way of life is the one that was traveled by all of the mighty messengers of God. Adam, Noah, Jesus, uh, Moses, all of the mighty messengers of God. And it was a very simple message. And it came and it was put the final seal of all of the prophets with the last and final messenger, Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with every single one of them. Because this is for the guidance of mankind. And this is not something that human beings should be afraid of. We, we have laws, we have uh, constitutions, we have things to help the people and give them guidance. Imagine if we had no laws and no guidance. It would be pure anarchy. So why can't we as human beings follow simple commandments given from the creator of the heavens and the earth? Do you not think that he knows better than we as feeble human beings know? Of course. So he's trying to help you. It's not meant to be placed on you as a burden. It's been meant to put there to protect you from the evils of the human condition. And so when you submit to this, which the submission is your whole body and your whole self to the will of Almighty God, and this is the definition of a Muslim. Islam itself literally means one who submits to the creator of heavens and the earth. And one that does this process is known as a Muslim. We consider all of the mighty messengers of God all Muslim from Adam all the way to the final messenger, Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with every single one of them and reward them for conveying this very clear message to all of mankind. Jamal Dean, Jay Dean, tell us, how do you feel someone can be convinced that Islam is indeed the truth from the Creator and that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is indeed the last and final messenger sent to mankind? Now, many people ask the same question of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of the people question the messengers of Almighty God with the same questions that you're asking. God Almighty Himself says in the Quran, He said, you shall know them by their acts. For one, they come to give you guidance, morals, and teachings, and they ask nothing in return. This is how we know the messengers of God. Look at every single one of them. Every single messenger of God lived very humble. 
They were very humble and meek servants or slaves of the Creator. They asked nothing of the people and they tried to give them morals, guidance, and support, and they tried to teach them a way of life. The Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him, when his companions, the, the disciples, when they came to him, they, they said, Yeah, Rabbi, Rabbi, or Yeah, Teacher, teach us how to worship the Creator of the heavens and earth. And what did Jesus, peace be upon him, tell his disciples? He said the Lord's Prayer, which every single Christian knows. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As you can see, the mighty messenger Jesus, may the peace and blessings be upon him, he kept on referring to thy kingdom come. He didn't say my kingdom come. And he said, give us our daily bread. So he was putting himself among the people. Each of the messengers of God never made themselves above human beings. They put themselves in the same shoes as the people that they were trying to to convey this message to. Same thing came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Arabs at the time, they questioned him and said, why didn't, they send, why didn't God Almighty send us, send us angels to give this message? Why is he giving us a, somebody this small little Bedouin out in the middle of the tribal region? Why? Why don't he give us someone with class and nobility, someone that is a better lineage than this man? They questioned him this. And God Almighty himself answered that question and said, it is I that chooses who the messengers are going to be, not you. And so every single one of these messengers had the same exact message from the very beginning all the way until the final end. And so this message is the one that every single good Muslim tries to follow. What advice do you have for people who are still living that life that you left behind? My best piece of advice that I can give you is that the soul of a human being is prone to evil. We like to follow the things that we are attached to. We like to follow the desires. Some men, for example, desire women. Some men desire wealth. Some men uh, desire children. Some men desire luxury. Some men desire bling bling. Uh, these things that are part of the earth. But when you die, can you take any of those with you? No. They all return back to the earth while you go to a hole that's six feet in the ground. And so you can't take any of this stuff with you. The only thing you can take with you are your good deeds. And so if you're stuck in a position like this, you have to understand that if you die in this state, there is no hope for you. But if you give up these things and you try to correct yourself and try to control your desires, then God will go ahead and give you support. There's a famous a hadith that the Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him, says that Allah, God Almighty, he said that if my servant takes one step towards me, I take 10 steps towards him. If he comes to me walking, I come to him running. If he remembers me in a company, I remember him in a con company that is greater than the company he remembered, which means the angels and you know the nobility. So if you do these things, if you take your intentions that you want to find out what the meaning of life is, what my purpose in life is, and you want to come from down here, because this only leads in misery. It, it may look flashy, it may look like it, 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 it's, it's a complete package that these people are happy and that you want to have these things, but this is a deception. Because if you actually go into the houses of these people and see the problems that these people have, you would say, I want no part of this. I know, I've been to that side. And it was something that I was shocked that that, that is a deception. It's a lie. And so these things you, you're going to have to get rid of anyhow. And so my advice to you is to seek out the truth. Seek out what is positive. Seek out your relationship with the Creator and He will not fail you. He will give you wealth beyond your dreams, if not in financial wealth, in spiritual wealth, where it counts the most. What advice, Jamal, Dean, do you have for your old boss who is a Muslim and the young lady that you knew that was a Muslim and many of the people out there who have this background who are Muslim more by name but not by action? 
My, my advice to you is the advice that I would give to any human being, uh, all in the same boat. These material things, for example, if, if you own a store and you're, you're selling alcohol and you're selling pornography and you're selling cigarettes and these sort of things, you may gain material wealth, but at what expense? You're giving up your soul. Why? Because you're, you're selling things that are harming human beings. And so if you're selling things that are harming human beings, what kind of human being will you be in the sights of Almighty God? You're promoting someone's demise. And so my advice is to give up that. I, I, know, I know Muslims that have owned these stores and they used to make a lot of money. And then we talk to them, we have conversations about these things and they give up these and they lose some money. They lose some money right off the bat, every single one of them. But after a couple months in that, because of their sacrifice, because of their wanting to change what is inside of themselves, God Almighty goes ahead and corrects their means in other ways. And so they get blessings from other areas that they never thought possible. And so my advice is to kick the devil out and go ahead and start trusting Almighty God. He is the one that is going to give you sustenance. So if all of mankind was to come and give you sustenance. They could not give you sustenance except for if God Almighty had written it. And if all of mankind came to take away all of your sustenance, nobody could take it away unless it was written by Almighty God. And so they need to turn back to what made them a Muslim in the first place. And they need to follow the Quran, which it is stated that alcohol and pornography and cigarettes and things that are harmful to your body are against the teachings of Islam. And they need to go back to the very basics of Islam and trust Almighty God. And that is the best advice that I can give to anybody. And for non-Muslims, this right here, these things right here, look at what it's doing to the society around you. Look at what, for example, like pornography, what it's doing to the society around you. You, you have children that are having horrible crimes being done to them. You have a lot of bad negative things that are being corrupting the society. Islam comes around and tries to correct the so social problems that are in an environment. And so these things are a benefit to you. So control your desires. And if you give up these things, if you give up these things, God Almighty said He will go ahead and help you out. He will help you out in means that you never thought possible. And so take a little uh, sacrifice for the, for the meantime and get a better reward for your sacrifice. That's it, we're out of time. If people wanna have a tour of the mosque and they wanna learn more about Islam and they're in your area, how can they look you up? Um, I'm very easy to uh, reach. Uh, you can contact me at www.caresmn.org or I uh, do the Dawa program for the, uh, Minnesota with the Minnesota Dawa Institute in Mesjid Dawa, located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, you can uh, find them on the web. Um, also, if you want to come to uh, Minneapolis, uh, I'm more than willing to take you on a tour of any of our mosques and show the different teachings that we are teaching the students. Uh, we're trying to teach them how to become good leaders, to become good husbands, to become good uh, wives, to become good uh, children, and to work on uh, getting education in both Islam and also in uh, non-Muslim education so they can become prominent citizens in the societies that they are in. And this is part of Islam. We're to be good neighbors, we're to be good people, and we're supposed to uphold what is right and to forbid what is wrong. And so we need to step up to the plate to help out all of our fellow man. Inshallah, God willing. Thank you very much. May God Almighty, the Creator of Allah, reward you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.